Hello again and welcome, and ho ho ho, to this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. We've got a fun episode today. I talk to Roy Huntington. We talk about what it's like to get that first gun under a Christmas tree. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment, but first, a quick word from our sponsor for Patriots. Prepare for those just-in-case situations with delicious and long-lasting emergency food kits from 4 Patriots. These survival meals will give your family the energy they need to get through any emergency. Their survival food kits are a great combination of taste and shelf life, making them perfect for any situation. And as a special offer to the Guns Magazine podcast audience, if you go to 4Patriots.com forward slash gunmag, you'll get weekly special deals and discounts. That's 4Patriots.com forward slash gunmag. Well, hello again, Roy, and Merry Almost Christmas. Merry Almost Christmas again. (laughs) Yep. Well, this uh, episode will air and publish, uh, I believe, on the 22nd, which is the Friday before Christmas. So uh, most folks around here celebrate Christmas. If that's not your chosen holiday, you know. Bear with us, but uh, a lot of folks, both religious and secular, do celebrate Christmas, so I thought this would be a good time to talk about Christmas gifts, and what is one of the most meaningful Christmas gifts a young uh, man or woman can receive, a kid, and that's a firearm. And this is the perfect time to talk about Christmas gifts and and things we remember, and, and hopefully that'll spark some reminiscence among our audience, and I'm really interested to hear uh, their stories of what they remember about Christmas. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Roy, you suggested this topic. Why don't you start? What was your first best gun that you ever got for Christmas? My first best gun, which is what I call it, you know, my first best gun. Um, I think you'll be putting a picture of uh, a yes. still from a eight millimeter movie taken in <laughs> Australia in 1964, and it's a then 10-year-old Roy uh, unboxing. In the film itself, I open the present, unbox it, and it's yeah. a Remington Model 514 uh, bolt-action 22 rifle. And my dad had been taking me out hunting for, oh, I don't know, six or eight months before that, and uh, but no gun. And all I did was follow him. And I was learning about how you do it and everything, and then he would let me carry my BB gun. Uh, but with, you know, always paying attention to muzzle control and just like it was a real gun. And uh, so I had no idea <laughs> that this 22 rifle was going to show up. And I, of course, had devoured anything I could find on 22 rifles. You know, <laughs> it, no Internet, of course, in those days. So you had to find a catalog or, yeah. you know. But in those days, Montgomery Ward, Sears catalog and stuff, they had guns. So... <laughs> You know, they, those pages were worn out, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, with my greasy little 10-year-old thumbprints all over them. And, uh, right. so i got to stop yeah. you there. Did you ever leave them laying around, turned to those pages? Because I did that all the time. All the time. I mean, it was a topic of conversation incessantly, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and of course, my dad was always cagey. Well, you know, we'll have to see. You know, when you get a little older, we'll see how things are and. You know, and that is not the answer you want to hear. <laughs> you know, when you're t- the answer you want to hear is, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go yeah. right now and get you one. You know, uh, we used to go to the gun stores because yeah, in those days, the good old days, there were gun stores in Australia. My dad was assigned to the embassy there, so he was in the Navy. So we were stationed there. And uh, so we would go to the gun stores and I would look at all the 22 rifles and, you know, and. And he would buy a box of 16-gauge shotgun shells because he had a bolt-action 16-gauge, which is what we used to take hunting with us. And fortunately, in Australia in those days, I think it's still the same, really. Uh, rabbits were out of control, and it would we would drive 20 minutes from our house and in the morning shoot 50 rabbits. Wow. <laughs> you know, and that was not an uncommon thing. And uh, so it was really interesting. It was a good time to be 10 years old with your first 22 rifle. Uh, but an interesting thing about this rifle, which, by the way, I still have, I still shoot, uh, and still, every time I click that bolt open and I hear the clack, clack, uh, I it just, this video starts playing in my mind, you know, uh, and 
you know, it, I remember when after we took the rifle out in the field with us and my dad showed me how to load it, showed what to do, showed me how to shoot it. Uh, then I had to carry it unloaded uh, for two or three more trips. So he put a sling on it. And so I would follow him up the trails and stuff uh, with an unloaded rifle. But I was still beaming. You know, it's like, yeah, this is my 22 rifle, right? Yeah. Uh, and then one day we went out there and he said, uh, because I carried ammunition. And he said, you got your ammo? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, load up. And so I thought we were going to stop and, you know, plink for a minute or something like that. So I loaded up. And he said, safety's on. I said, safety's on. And he said, okay. And he turned around and he walked up the road. And I, that, that was the moment of my first step to manhood because <laughs> I, my dad turned his back on me and I had a loaded rifle and I followed him up the trail. Wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, it literally was the first step to manhood for me. Yeah. And I think a lot of the non-shooters don't, uh, re really understand that i mean i i don't think you get that with a skateboard no you know not at all uh or a video game or i mean i don't know a new baseball mitt <laughs> or, yep. you know i mean it's there's it's just something about this yeah it it truly is your entry into manhood or womanhood when you're entrusted with a deadly weapon even though it's just a 22 they've killed a lot of folks and and I, I can think of my own history when, you know, I was finally entrusted with that responsibility that I didn't have somebody hovering over me, you know. But this is going to be hard, but describe your feelings when you saw that, that gun for the first time. Oh, I remember it vividly. It, I mean, I remember when I, as I tore the paper off and I saw the box and the box, it was a, it was a cardboard box. And I, it was heavy, and I, I was—I knew something here was going on. <laughs> I really, honestly thought it was going to be another BB gun, uh -huh. and so I, I remember I was sort of gearing up my enthusiasm, right? Because <laughs> because really I wanted a twenty-two, and yeah. so if it was going to be a BB gun, I'm still going to go. Oh gosh, thanks! This is the coolest thing ever, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then when I opened up the box, and then I saw a Remington, you know, label. And then I, and when I tilted it like this, I swear to you, and this is a great part of the story, some loose twenty two cartridges fell out <laughs> when I when I opened up the flap of the box. And then I pulled it out and I realized that it was it was what I wanted. It was a wow. Remington model five fourteen single shot twenty two. Which my grandparents had bought in the United States and shipped to Australia <laughs> in the mail. With ammo in the box, because <laughs> you could do that in those days, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, so, oh gosh, it was just astounding. I mean, it, th that's where I think nowadays, as you get older and you get more immune to the surprises and fun things and cool things and stuff, I think we all remember when we were kids, that new fill-in-the-blank was anticipation and satisfaction and happiness and days of playing afterwards and all that. Yeah. And now, you know, we tend to come home with a brand new Mercedes and park it in the driveway. And then you like, go, Oh, okay. And then you go to the bathroom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's the simple pleasures. I think at many levels are, are disappear from us. So, uh, but yeah, whew, Lord. And I still have all those feelings when I pick up that yeah. rifle. And uh, it's in cool. that there's a rack behind me. I think you can see it there. Uh -huh. um, it's it's in that rack. It's one oh, of wow. those guns that's in that rack uh, because cool. I pick it up and I shoot it all the time. So tell me about your first gun. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny before I do that, when you're talking about that satisfaction and thrill, I got to say, I have a hard time thinking of any time other than you know, back then as a kid, telling the story I'm going to get, or really any anything you really wanted really bad, and when you got it, it was it was like the heavens opened and the choir started singing, and oh yeah, life was good. You know, that's yeah. that's back when we didn't have as many worries as we have today. So, well, well there was no internet. 
And, yes. and we had to manufacture our own happiness and our own satisfaction and yep. our own, you know, appreciation. And and now I think what happens is that they go online and they wait for somebody to to give them that. Yep. You know? And well, so, you know, I recently wrote an insider talking about my one of one of my favorite weapons as a kid was the dirt clod. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. Those of us of a certain age if you grew up in a suburban or rural area, a dirt clod was, it was a, a rifle, a pistol, a grenade, uh, you know, it, that's just what we played with. And, and I can only imagine if, if I went to, you know, kids nowadays and go, here, go play with this. They'll be like, well, where do the batteries go? You know? So it's just. That's funny. I wrote an article one time and it was something, I forget what it was called, something like shooter of clods. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> they were it good was, targets it was, too, yeah. And they were great targets because they kind of explode, yeah. you know, and they were free and there were gazillions of them everywhere. But yeah, you're right. Dirt clogs, they were the weapon of choice. <laughs> they were. So yeah, I forget which month that is, but uh, one of the back issues of Guns Magazine, The Insider, I think it's a month or two ago, and it's called The Ballistic, The BC of Dirt, The Ballistic Coefficient <laughs> of Dirt. So got quite a few emails over that one. But on to my story. And I got to say, I grew up in a suburban area, um, right on the edge of town. We live in a small town, and all of my friends had farms. So I, I, I almost consider myself a farm kid because I spent most of my time, you know, I've, I've cleaned out, I've mucked out stalls, and uh, I'm pretty sure I got my uh, uh, respiratory problems from playing in the hayloft. Uh, you know, there was nothing cooler than a hayloft if you've never had that opportunity, uh, building forts with the square bales and all that. But... One thing that, uh, as a kid, that was different from my childhood than a lot of my friends is my parents did not shoot at all. Uh, my grandparents owned uh, guns, both my sets of grandparents. They were still alive. They, they shot. But uh, my dad and mom, just that wasn't their thing. Um, they, they were more urbane, I guess you would say. So, uh, you know, they say things skip a generation. So, uh, especially one of uh, my dad's grandpa, I wanted to be like him. He was a motorcycle racer and a machinist, and uh, he he shot, and th that was the guy in my life. And I wanted to be like him. So, starting at a pretty early age, um, I didn't get to spend a lot of time around guns, but I sure had outdoor life, sports afield, guns magazine, guns and ammo and anything else back when the newsstand was huge. So uh, I would read up, you know, some of my favorite authors, Peter Capstick, and, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, trying to think some of the old writers that I really enjoyed. But um, I would read those, and then I would go to the Montgomery Ward and Sears and J.C. Penney catalogs and, you know, couldn't decide if I needed a 22 lever action or if I should just get a Marlin yeah. 30 30 for the elk that, you know, didn't mm. run rampant in our backyard. And, you know, of course, and I needed a shotgun though for when I go uh, quail hunting someday. And it was, it was pretty funny, but I kept asking for a gun and my, my parents respectfully said, are you out of your freaking mind? We're not going to buy you a gun. <laughs> we don't know anything about guns. Talk to your grandfather. <laughs> So I begged him, and you know he just laughed and <laughs> told me to go outside and play. So I didn't even have a BB gun. So I was probably about twelve ish, I guess. And uh, the the funny thing is, and I wrote a story about this. I think it was a year or two ago. About I was a well known sneaker. I would wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> I meant to talk to you about that. Yeah. <laughs> and what I would do is I couldn't stand not knowing what my presents were going to be. So <laughs> I would, and I had overdosed on Peter Capstick at this point. Yeah. So I, I pictured myself in, in darkest Africa. And of course, there were wild dogs afoot that I had to stay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, away from lest they raise the alarm and my parents find me but you know I would I I really truly did learn stalking techniques from sneaking from my bedroom out to the living room and then carefully and cautiously unwrapping packages and I even had uh, swiped a roll of cellophane tape in case I had to repair something um I mean this was a thing with me well anyway there was one package I was pretty sure held a 22 uh, uh, rifle. And 
when Christmas Day finally came, and I, that was a year I never really got into, and I think my parents had, had set up a number of booby traps because they suspected me. But uh, anyway, when I, I finally got to open it, and it was lighter than what I figured, you know, 22 rifles must be pretty light. Well, as it turned out, it was a, a Daisy BB gun, and I can't remember. I don't oh. think it was a Red Rider, but it was like a Model 39. It was, it was just a cheap, pressed, you know, it did have a wood stock, but made out of, you know, packing cartons or something. But yeah. after my just split second disappointment that it wasn't a thirty thirty, and then I realized, well, at least I've got a gun now, you know? <laughs> and it was just the most wonderful thought. And I couldn't wait to get outside and, and shoot at game, you know, sparrows and <laughs> robins and neighborhood dogs it's and my true. friends. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was funny. I almost went to sleep with it. My parents were like, you know, no, 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 no. We'll put that away. And you're only under supervision and wear glasses. And, you know, because back mm -hmm. then they were worried to death about you putting an eye out. It's that was true. When, they you would turn your you loose. Eye yeah, don't, your eye don't shoot <laughs> your friend. You know, don't shoot your brother. Uh, you'll put his eye yeah. out. So right. I, I have no idea. And I didn't know that many people that only had one eye, but that was, I mean, my grandparents <laughs> did it. My parents did it. My friend's parents <laughs> did it. Now, be careful. You're yep. going to put an eye out. So yep. that was my first gun, and I... Uh, Ended up modifying it later because, you know, I started reading about all these custom guns and I've got a rifle. I want to customize it. So I made a butt stock out of a two by four and it wasn't wholly unattractive. Well, yes, it was horribly unattractive. And I, I believe I wrote about that, too. So uh, that was my first gun. And uh, to date, it has been my only gun under the Christmas tree. So it, it still it, it at age 10 or 12, probably 10. It really uh, it it warmed my heart, and I I still have warm and fuzzy feelings over that moment where you rip the packing off the pa the the wrapping off, and you realize I have a gun. I can hunt elk now with that one seven seven caliber <laughs> BB. <laughs> it does start the process, though. You know, you you do whether or not you're trained or not, you begin to learn trigger control and muzzle safety and all that yep. <laughs> even even though you violate all that stuff constantly <laughs> oh, absolutely. you know and we learned because one of the first things we did with the, because i had a bb gun of course is that you know, you shoot each other in the leg exactly and even with old blue jeans on it would still hurt it's like done. a son of a gun and give you a, a welt you know and yeah. it's like it, that was very funny i think one of the things though it's like you look at all these memories you have of it right now. And, of course, if you had that gun right now oh. and you picked it up, I mean, it would just it, – it it's people that don't realize that there really are time machines. Yeah. And uh, and they're in the guise of, of different kinds of old guns that we first got. Um, I don't know if today's youth have that same sense of anticipation that we had for these things because, you know, do – do they feel that same way and do all that research in waiting for their Xbox at Christmas? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, do they just expect it? They've already been playing it. They already know all about it. You know, when they get it, yeah. it's like, hey, bitchin, and then now what? You know, what? So so I don't know. But, but like I remember when I was about 12 or 13, we had moved back to the States. And there was a Sears store. Remember, Sears was a magical store. Yeah. Because it had everything. It had guns and it had it, mini it bikes Amazon. and the automotive. So it was Amazon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because I used to go out and look at the green, painted green mini bikes that were out in the <laughs> auto center. Yep. I remember they were $65. I would have given most Ooh. of my right arm for one. I know. Yep. Closest I ever came was I think I saved up like $12 one time and then I had <laughs> to buy something else, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, Sears was this in craftsman tools, you know, that amazing candy department. They had the boring clothes department for, you yeah. know, where you had to go shopping for school clothes and stuff. But they had a gun department. And in the gun department were all the ammunition. Remember, it was uh, Ted Williams was their yes. store brand. Yep. Ted Williams ammunition, ten, uh, guns. Even though the guns were all Mossbergs and Savages and, you know, they, yeah. they were marked Ted Williams, yep. right? Winchesters, and um, but they had a display of buck knives. Ah, uh, yes. And I you may remember about that. those. Every remember? counter had the buck one ten and several others. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a like a just a 
glass face and it was yep. square and it was at an angle and they were all sitting in their little you know things there yeah and so they had some fixed blade knives and then there was a 110 folder of course uh and so i i would just i was knife crazy you know and there really were not those sort of custom knives i mean right. there were you know case and uh, you know a couple knives like that and they were all basically folding knives that farmers would use yeah <laughs> you know there was really nothing much that we got my eye but these buck knives and of course i read about buck knives in the in the gun magazines and stuff so they were magical and mythical and they were they were well beyond any reach that i possibly could have ever <laughs> imagined yeah i mean they were like 22 dollars you know yeah. when you wow. could get a really good pocket knife for a dollar 50 yeah and uh, so I used to go there every time we went to Sears, and I would always ask the guy, and they all knew me, of course, right? And they were always so nice about getting guns out and letting this punk little 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid <laughs> look at these guns. And uh, they used to open ammo boxes and show me the ammo, you know, really? and explain things. This was at Sears, for crying out loud. Yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> But I remember they would always open up this knife display. Just when they saw me, they would go over to Kentucky and they would open up the knife display. It had a little brass padlock on the bottom, I remember. Yeah. But there was one knife called the the 105 Pathfind. No, Personal. That's what it was called, the 105 Personal. And that was the one I needed, uh -huh. you know. And so I held it, held it, held it, and looked at it a thousand times. And then uh, <laughs> finally I leaving your oh mouth. yeah yeah and so finally um my dad asked me what did i want for christmas and i said well there's really only one thing in the entire world <laughs> of everything that you is made in society that i want <laughs> you know and that is this knife and and i remember because he was an enlisted man we didn't have a lot of money in the in you know in the navy at the time but i remember he, he was like kind of went whoa you know 22 dollars <laughs> i mean yeah. You know, twenty-two dollars was, yeah. You could pay half a month's rent for twenty-two dollars, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I just went, yeah, okay. I guess I'm never ever going to get that. Well, lo and behold, Christmas time comes around. What happens? I open it up. There's a small box. I opened it up. I had no idea what it is, and I opened it up, and there's buck. It was I'm a kind of a done. tan, yeah, buck on the top. You know, yeah. And uh, I just, I, I get chills. Even now, that unbelievable sense of anticipation and satisfaction wow. and gratification. You know it. Yep. You know. Yep. When I opened that lid and I saw that black leather buck, peculiar buck flap case, you know. Yep. And I opened it up and it was like, I, that kept me high for the next <laughs> year. You know, I mean, yep. all you had to do was I just had to go in my room and get my knife and have it. And yep. I was a happy guy. And you know what? I still have that knife. <laughs> Amazing. I I and have shed I all this it. stuff over the years. I, no, I don't have no. much in the way of, of stuff from childhood like that, but I wish I did. I, Just... I wish I had it handy. I mean, it's not here. <laughs> I have it in a drawer, but uh, I still have it. And as a matter of fact, I engraved my initials, RPH, <laughs> on the Bakelite, not Bakelite, but some kind of a plastic handle yeah. uh, and kind of crude 12 year old boy <laughs> you know block printing rph oh, is written funny. there and i still have that so but i don't know i think that's what we're talking about though is that now when i pick that knife up i remember the 12 year old who held that same knife yeah you know that that cleaned his first rabbit with it that put it on his belt the first time he ever you know could go shooting with his dad with it yeah, uh, and and it I, all that stuff taught us all a lot of things. Yep. Well, I, I was going to say though, what was the probably the first thing, and I bet you did it too. Is you had you know it was Christmas Day. We're we're getting into lunchtime now. I gotta go run over to Tommy or Billy's, and I gotta show them this. This is this is critical, man. They they need to know. 
And, you know, usually you would take it over and then they got something cool too that you were like, oh, well, I thought I was the only one who was the happiest boy in the entire United States. <laughs> you know, it was just funny. And, you know, you, then that evening we'd all be outside if the you know weather permitting and we'd have our new rifles and we'd knives and, you know, our Davy Crockett coonskin cap and all that stuff. And we new, were new bicycles. New bicycles. Yeah, down the we were high style. Everywhere. Yeah. So no. You know, well, I was going to say that that's that's a topic for another episode. I hope we remember. And I've talked about it a couple of times. I actually assigned the story at one point, and it never got written. The hardware slash department store guns, Sears. Uh, locally, Montgomery Ward had the biggest gun counter, and they had mm-hmm. everything. Uh, our local Ace Hardware. Uh, that's where uh, you know they they had all kinds of guns. I bought my first traps over there. When I was trapping at age 12 on the golf course, I bought my traps at Ace Hardware at the gun counter. And, uh, you know. I think we did a gun cranks on this. I think did we, we did, now that you say that. that. Yeah. yeah. On, on store brand guns, you know. Yeah. And, of course, they were all, like, I recently sold a, uh, a Ted Williams shotgun, over and yeah. under shotgun, but it was a Winchester. Yep. It was a Winchester 101, I think. And, uh,. And so, so in the old days, people would say, oh, Ted Williams, oh, that's just Sears brand. Yeah. But the savvy shooters went, no, actually, that's a Winchester, and yep. <laughs> you know, you can get it cheaper, and so you should buy that. Uh, yep. You know, I, I think in retrospect, too, part of the things that I remember is the fact that we were trusted with this stuff. Yeah. In other words, I was actually trusted. I was allowed to get my twenty two rifle out and clean it, you know, yeah. and... And every and put it away. Uh, I was allowed to get my knife and learn to sharpen it and take it outside and do chores. Yep. Uh, and like you say, take it next door, show it to you know <laughs> Billy, your best friend, neighbor, and stuff. Yeah. And then he would show you his BB gun or whatever he got. Yeah. You know. And I, well, it was sure a different time. Huh? It was, and you know, for me, it's funny looking back. I didn't appreciate the advantages I was given. You know, I, I, I had friends that literally lived, you know, in, in some less than uh, ideal, you know, houses, but, you know, they and they hunted for dinner, literally. You know, they ate deer and they went out rabbit hunting for dinner. And I always thought that was the coolest thing ever, you know. <laughs> and to me, all this outdoor gear, guns, uh, all that stuff, even the BB gun, it represented to me that someday I'll be part of... I'll do things differently that, and it'll be better. I'll be a mountain man living, you know, on a, on a mountain somewhere and hunting elk and trapping furs and all that stuff. And, you know, nowadays, and, and Patrick McManus wrote a lot about this, that, you know, you, you would have to have a briefcase for all your permits and you probably get yourself clear cut or irradiated by a cell phone tower. But, uh, you know, I, I just thought that was the life I wanted to live as that suburban kid out there with his BB gun stalking the wily, uh, you know, sparrow or whatever. But it just well, it represented so much when you when you got that stuff. I think I think that the reality is somewhere between the two. You know, uh, I mean, you I I actually am living that reality here. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it's like we we still have the sort of urban civilized sensibilities, but we also have the Gee, it, there's snow out, and I have to go get the tractor, you yeah. know, or the feral pigs are in the backyard. We need to take care of this problem, and so yeah. I think it's that's the natural way we're supposed to live, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, I I don't know what even how we can capture this, and maybe it's just us, and maybe the younger people today, maybe they just don't need that. But yeah. there's a part of me that says. If they've never been exposed to it, which they have never been exposed to it, then they don't know what they're missing. Because yeah. with rare exceptions, when I have a young person visit us, you know, some 14-year-old kid or whatever, 12 years old, you know, relative or friend of somebody come over here. And they're these urban sophisticates with their video game in their hand constantly, you know. And I get him to put that down, and we go outside and I put a pair of leather gloves on him, and he learns how to use a chainsaw and comes back in covered in in you know <laughs> wood chips yeah. and a cut 
on his nose from where a branch got him. Yeah. And they, they're, they're just like so alive. It's yeah. like, it's the they first glow. time they've ever actually really smelled something and yeah. actually really felt a chainsaw running in their hand, you know, yeah. or drove the tractor or fed the chickens or, you know, did something for real. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I think well, we need more of that now. We do. We do. And I was going to say, that's that's a great place to end this, our, our reminiscence of, of Christmas past. And I, I'm really looking forward to, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment, a short comment, hopefully. And if you're listening on the audio podcast, drop me a line, uh, editor at gunsmagazine.com. Let's hear your Christmas remembrances in relation to shooting or just in general. I think there'll be some good stories. And uh, this will go up on Friday, what did I say, the 22nd. Um, we're off the week. Uh, I didn't tell Roy this. We, we get the whole week of Christmas off, first time the company's ever done that, even though I work from home, so I'll be working. But I'll tell you what I will be doing. I'll be checking my email and uh, looking at my YouTube comments because I'm sure there'll be some good stuff out there that will help put us into the Christmas spirit. So, well, Roy, may, may I add one thing? Yes, Wait, absolutely. One thing, if you don't mind, if if the, someone's willing to take the time to send you an email, uh, editor at gunsmagazine.com, if you have a picture of yourself ah. uh, with the gun, your first gun when you were yeah. a kid, or your son or daughter and their first gun, first BB gun, whatever, uh, make sure you attach that and send it to Brent. Because I'll bet you I could twist his arm and, and get him to run a few of those in the yeah. reader mail or something. Yep. So that'd be fun. That will be fun. Cool. So. Drop us a line, either comment below on YouTube or uh, editor at gunsmagazine.com. Well, Roy, we're actually recording this a few days before it's published, because that's how things have to work. But uh, by the time this thing airs, we'll just be a couple of days before Christmas. So I hope you and your lovely wife, Susie, have a wonderful Christmas. And uh, I've got a special Christmas gift that Roy has made uh Made one for me and for my brother, and I can't wait to see his face. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, again, it's been a wonderful year. I appreciate everything you've done for me personally and everything you've done for Guns Magazine and our podcast audience. And I just really enjoy our talks here on the Guns Magazine podcast. Me too, Brent. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate the opportunity. So you guys have a good Christmas, everybody. Well, I hope my chat with Roy Huntington gave you a little holiday spirit and maybe got you thinking about some of your best Christmas past. Before we go, I'd like to remind you to check out our great sponsor, 4Patriots. For all your preparedness needs and supplies, if you go to 4Patriots.com forward slash gun mag, that's where you can see exclusive deals and offers for the Guns Magazine podcast audience. That's the number four, the word Patriots.com forward slash gun mag for deals and discounts. Well, that's it for this pre-Christmas episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. I wish you a happy holiday on behalf of all of my co-workers here at FMG Publications. And I'd like to remind you, once you get that gun under the Christmas tree, now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>